Uh, my name is John. If I haven't met you, welcome to week six of Battle Ready. Uh, we are in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, if you want to go ahead and open up there, you can. Uh, this is what we've been saying, right? For a number of weeks now, we've been saying and agreeing with what the Bible is teaching that there is a struggle. Say with me, there is a what? A, yeah, there's a struggle. There is a fight. There is a battle. C.S. Lewis writes it this way. There's no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. You're like, John, you've been reading that every week. Here's what I know. Life happens. We forget. We begin to forget. And some of you, you've been suiting up with the armor of God. Some of you, you've been putting on the full armor of God and you've been taking your stand, haven't you? And here's what you've been experiencing as you've been taking your stand. As God's been armoring you and equipping you with what you need to fight, you've been pushing back the enemy. You've been taking some ground. You're starting to live your life behind enemy lines. And guess what? The enemy doesn't like it. He's pushing back at you. You felt more attacked this past week than the last time you can ever remember. It feels as though he's coming after your kids. He's coming after your job. It feels as though he is attacking you. Why? It's because you have been plundering what used to be his. And so we need the armor of God. If you guys remember last week, we said, all right, the first three parts, aspects of the armor of God, it's as if that soldier always had those on. And then there was a transition because of the verb usage that Paul uses saying, all right, now the battle is intensifying. So we need to take up three more things. You guys remember this. Last week, what did we take up? We take up the shield. Yeah, remember that? The big shield, not the small one, the big one. And what do we do? We get behind it. How do we get behind it? We get humble. You guys remember this. It wasn't that long ago, just last week. Remember? We get behind it. We get low. Oh, we get low. We get behind the shield, right? The shield of faith. Why? Because when we are full of pride, that moves us away from the protection of God. When we are filled with pride, we're not shielded any longer by faith. I had some pride moments this past week. I'll go first. Don't leave me up here. You did as well, right? And some of us, we felt it, right? We experienced it. And what happened in that moment, God's like, you're not behind the shield. You're not behind the shield. So we got to get low. We got to be humble. We got to live the pattern that Jesus set for us. Here's what he says in verse 16. Look there in verse 16, right? As the battle is intensifying, Paul says there's a few more things you got to add to it. He says, in addition to all this, the first three, take up the shield of faith, and we take that up because it needs to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. In fact, they would even dip those shields in water so that it could extinguish these flaming arrows. But he says, not only in that, we got to, we got to put on something else. We got to take the helmet of salvation. Say that with me. Take the helmet of salvation. How good is God to line this up for me to speak about a helmet on Super Bowl Sunday, all right? Some of you are like, John is, no, I'm not a planner. I'm like, I'm not that good, all right? It's pretty cool, right? Today, on Super Bowl Sunday, we are learning something we have to learn, and it's this, the battle isn't won through muscle. It's won through the mind. I wish it were won through, mu through muscle, quite frankly, but it's not. It's one through the mind. Why? Whatever has your mind has you. Where the mind goes, everything else will follow. The mind, it overrides everything. And I know you have some will that is strong, but it's no match for the mind. Your, your mind eats your will for breakfast. The mind, man, whatever has it has you. Whoever has it has you. Where the mind goes, everything else will follow. Now, I want you to think about the most fiercest opponents in sports history. Uh, some of us, we, we understand the things of God as we use sermon uh, illustrations that are with sports. And so I try to do that every week. I, I want you to think about some of the fiercest opponents ever in the history of sports. I think first about Muhammad Ali. Some of you used to watch him fight, right? Show of hands. Yeah, you guys remember this. Muhammad Ali, if you do any research on him, this is fascinating. In a documentary recently, this is what he said. He said at the weigh-in, the press conference, he knew if he was going to win or lose. How did he know it? By looking into the eyes of the opponent. He said if the opponent would look like a different direction or would slump his shoulders, he said this, put the crown on me, I'm heading to the ring. And what did Muhammad Ali do? I mean, you can argue he did better than anyone. He talked some trash. I mean, think of the mind games that this guy played with people right? He got into their dome. He got into their head. What did he know? 
right? He knows what the devil knows. Whatever has your mind has you. Where the mind goes, everything else will follow. Think of Arnold Schwarzenegger, the governor. Um, you, you've heard of him before. If you do some research on his sports career in bodybuilding, he knew this. He knew that it was often won, Mr. Universe, through mind games. Uh, there was this opponent of his named Lou. Uh, Lou Ferrig- Ferrigno or Ferrigna. And uh, I saw some interviews about this that were, it was actually sad, but it's, it's also kind of a little bit funny. Um, what Arnold would do to Lou is he would just get in his dome. It was so bad. He would actually say, <laughs> I actually should have Chaz do this. You have such a good Arnold <laughs> impersonation. <laughs> you say, um, you're too little, Lou. He would, he would tell Lou that he was little. He said, look at your wee biceps. <laughs> he said, you're too little, Lou. And Lou, you could see on the film, would start to believe it, right? And they'd get into the contest of Mr. Universe and what would happen, Arnold would win yet again. Now, let's think of the inverse of that. Think of those that were at the all-time top, right? Back when Tiger was Tiger, no one could get in his head. No one. I was talking to a guy after the first service that saw him play live. When he was at the peak of his game, he was about to win the PGA Championship, he said as Tiger passed them, you could feel his focus. He said it was like shockwaves. He said, you could literally feel it. Think about tonight. Who's playing quarterback? That's probably going to win the sixth Super Bowl in his career. Tom Brady. And ladies, uh, you're welcome. I brought a picture uh, of Tom. (laughs) Think about this. He's the greatest quarterback that's ever played the game. Most people would agree with that. Is it because of how athletic he is? Yes or no? No. Right? Uh, Is it because of how strong he is? Yes or no? Right? I'm probably stronger than he is. I mean, I've seen some of these pictures. I mean, he's like not that built. He, I mean, if you, have you seen him run? It's like painful to watch how uncoordinated he runs. It's, it's like, it's, like a, it's, it's bad. Why is he the best of all time? Well, but what is between his ears? It's his mind. It's his mind, right? And this is what God's word is helping us understand. We need protection for our minds. Why the mind overrides everything. This is why the Bible writes about it so much. Your body doesn't call the shots. Your mind does. What you hold in your mind will often happen in your life. It's fascinating how this works. When you think like you've always thought, you will live like you've always lived. This is why the Bible speaks about the mind. Research in brain science now shows and proves that a thought isn't fleeting. It's actually forming something. Really interesting. It's forming something. Here's how it works. As a thought travels through your brain... Neurons fire together, forming patterns or roads within your brain. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, be a brain scientist for two minutes, because that's about as long as I can speak intelligently into this topic, all right? Brain science has been discovering fascinating things. Three years ago, I talked to you about it, but I want to talk to you about it again. It's really important. Brain science is now helping people understand that what is going on from your mind and thoughts to your brain, those begin to actually form your brain. What happens is those thoughts, if they're not taken captive and made obedient to Christ, they begin to actually build roads in your brain. It begins to change it. It's a fascinating thing. Let me explain it through a story. For seven years or eight years in a row, I went pheasant hunting out in South Dakota. Uh, Then I planted mission and some of my hobbies had to go by the wayside. Uh, But every year when I'd go out to South Dakota, we'd, we'd pull off of the blacktop and we get onto uh, some gravel roads, and then we pull off the gravel road, and we get onto the dirt road. This is where we'd go hunting. And, and the last time I was there, I was driving my dad's uh, expedition. I remember this. And I pulled off on that dirt road, and that dirt road had been traveled so frequently by other hunters like myself that there were deep what in, in the road? Deep ruts in the road. You've been on dirt roads like this before. And so here's what you know if you've driven on roads like that. You could pull onto that road, as I did, and you could let go of the wheel. It didn't matter if you wanted to go left or go right. You're going where those ruts are leading you. And the brain is actually built in the same way. Your thoughts, right, begin to move and shape your brain, forming roads in your brain that take you. It's like autopilot. This is why you can have two different people that experience the same exact circumstance yet respond in two completely different ways. You've seen this before, haven't you? 
the same circumstance. Someone over here, the way they respond, because they have not taken their thoughts captive, they respond with fear and anxiety. And some of you know this has been your battle. It's as if your brain is on autopilot, right? All of a sudden, without you even have to do anything, you're overwhelmed with fear. Why? Because the amount of times that pathway, that road, has been traveled. The other person, they could have experienced the same exact thing, yet they're not led to fear, they're led to a place of peace. This is really important for you to know about the brain. John Ortberg writes it this way, the mind shapes the brain. Neurons that wire together, fire together. In other words, when you practice hope, emphasis on hope, you're traveling in that way. When you practice love or joy, your mind is actually, literally, rewiring your brain. This is why meditation, not on nothing, meditation on the Bible, on God's word, is so transformational. When we meditate, when we memorize the word of God, it literally changes your brain. There's, like science proves this now. It's the coolest thing, right? All of a sudden, we take our thoughts captive. We make them obedient to Christ, and new roadways are actually built in our brain that lead us to places of peace instead of fear and anxiety. But here's the thing. You will not build those roadways on accident. You won't. It has to be done decisively and intentionally. A former uh, guy that I used to work with, he's a mentor of mine named Mike Bro. He used to always say to me, son or John, you need to every single day re-wallpaper your mind to the truth of God's word. And some of you used to deal with wallpaper before, right? You're not wallpapering anything on accident. Paul writes in Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what do we do? We think about such things. This becomes our filter. This becomes our filter. Jonathan Edwards said it this way, the ideas and images in men's minds are the invisible powers that constantly govern them. This is why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10.5, what do we do? We demolish, demolish. I mean, this is battle language. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And what do we do? We take captive. Say it with me. We take I want you to get pumped right now, all right? This isn't going to happen like in some kind of wuss way. You got to get, you got to get mad. I mean, you got to say, no, you're not, no, I'm taking this thought captive. And it's going to become obedient to Christ. No, 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 I'm standing up. I'm holding my ground. This mind, when I became a Christian, I'm given the mind of Christ. And every day, it's going to be formed more and more and more into his image. No, we're, we're going to take these thoughts captive. We're not going to be lazy. We're not going to be passive. No, we're going to take them captive. We're going to take these thoughts captive. We're going to make them obedient to Christ. This is battle language. Here's how this could look. This is how it looked for me. When I was 22, at the end of my college experience, that is when the reckless love of God became such a reality to me. It, it literally changed everything about me. I've never been the same since. I grew up knowing a lot about God, and there were some, I had some good moments with God, but when I started college, I ran from the love of God, and I'm pretty fast. I ran from the love of God. My college roommate, can, he, he could give you some stories, and I pray that he never does. It was at the end of college, I encountered Jesus. I just, I haven't been the same. But here's what happened. I was radically saved in a radical way. But you know what I still had? I still had all these toxic patterns and thoughts in my life. I just did. Why? Because from the age of 12 to 22, I did a lot of things. And I looked at a lot of things. And I listened to a lot of things that were very far from what God would want me to put inside of my mind. Am I preaching? Am I making sense to some of you? Some of you have a past like mine. Some of you made some decisions like that, right? The ear gate or the eye gate, it begins to, it just begins to wreak havoc on our mind. And so here I am, I'm trying to follow Jesus. I graduate college, I move back home. Me and my buddies, we're, we're starting a ministry at my dad's church and there's momentum in my life and there's all kinds of battles going on in my mind. And so someone gave me the, the practice of, of taking flashcards 
and writing on these flashcards Bible verses. Uh, Back in that day, I called them grenades. I needed something quick that I could pull the pin and launch at the attacks of the enemy. And I vividly remember, me and some of my friends back then, we were all out uh, bowling. And we were having a great time. And everyone was kind of talking and laughing. But I was having other conversations with myself. Some of you know what that's like. See, I had such toxic thought patterns. I couldn't just see some, I mean, the amount of things in my mind. And so here I am at the bowling alley. I would turn aside as all these people in their 20s are just having a good time. I would turn aside and I would pull out of my pocket flashcards. And I would just, I would again, just, just keep the love of God and this truth and his promises. I would just be pouring it over my mind, over my mind. Why? I was desperate. I needed my mind to be renewed. I needed patterns to be shut down. Here's what's amazing. Brain science now teaches this. Those roads that lead you to places away from God can literally be shut down in your brain if they're no longer traveled. They need a roadblock, and the roadblock is the word of God. You're going to learn more about it next week. And so I had flashcards. It wasn't just like a nice quote on there. It was the word of God. And I would read it, and I would memorize it, launching grenades at the attacks of the enemy. What has happened since those days? Those paths, those roads, I'm telling you, because they aren't traveled, they've become overgrown. I don't go there anymore. When I look at my wife, I see her and no one else. You know what I'm saying? Like God has given me a new mind. I'm loving him with my mind. This is what Paul is saying. Of all the armor, man, you've got to protect the mind. Whoever has it has you. And this is how we do it, right? We take these thoughts Captive. Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Listen to this. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. What do we do? We set our minds on things above. We set them on things above, not on earthly things. My dad passed this quote to me this week. I love it. Listen to this. Watch your thoughts. They become words. Watch your words. They become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. And where does it all begin? Right here, in your mind. In your mind. Instead of being taken captive by our thoughts, we begin to take those thoughts captive. Romans 12, 2, this is one of like the, the famous verses on this. It's so good. This has been so helpful for me. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. And for me, man, it was years of just conforming. My mind was shaped the way of the world. It says, no, no, no. You've been bought with a price now. You're a new person. You're a new creation, right? You've been changed, and I am changing you. So no, we're not going to conform any any longer to the patterns of this world. What does he say? But be transformed. Be transformed. How? By the renewing of your what? Your mind. Now, let me give you a quick grammar lesson because you love when I do this to you. This is written, be transformed in the present passive imperative form. And that's become one of our favorite tenses, right? When things are written that way. Why? Because it's just so powerful. Be transformed. Let me go through it real quick. It's in the imperative. What does that mean? It means it's a command. And it would not be a command unless it led you to roads of peace and prosperity and wholeness. God isn't just powering up on you because he can he made you. He loves you. He, he is offering you abundant life. He wants you to experience this kind of life. It's a, it's a command. It's imperative. Be transformed. He's not messing around. He's saying not if you have time. Not if you complete your other items on your to-do list. This is the top. Be transformed. Make it the primary thing in your life. It's imperative. It's also in the passive tense. What does that mean? Here's what it means. It doesn't mean like be passive. That's not what that means. It actually means it's ongoing. Right? It means, I'm sorry, that's the present. Passive means this. The action of the verb is done to the subject. All right, this is good. Listen, the action of the verb is done to the subject. What does that mean? Here's what this means. We have a command to be transformed by someone else. This is what the passive tense means. This is actually great news. When we think be transformed, like, oh my goodness, I I don't know if I can do that. You can't do that. God's saying, I know you, okay? I'm the one that's gonna do that. Since when, over the last six weeks, have I been asking you to suit up in your own stinking armor? I haven't done it yet, and I never will, because it doesn't work. It doesn't work. 
right? That's what the passive tense means. We have a command to be transformed by someone else. Present, all right? Let me get this one right this time. What does present mean? It means that it is ongoing. And I know that some of you have heard it before. I need this reminder every day that I am unfinished. I'm telling you I have not arrived. I am telling you that this needs to be a priority every single day. I wish it was one and done, but it's not. It's in the present tense, right? Our thoughts have to be wrangled. This morning I was finishing up this message. I was thinking about my thoughts like my girls when I try to put them down at night. Some of you have young kids. Do they stay in their room? It's unbelievable. The, and one of mine is in here right now, and I hope she's listening. Um, how good they are at escaping during bedtime, right? You get them in the place, right? You get them right where they need to be. You walk out of the room. You're high-fiving the Lord. You're high-fiving your wife. This is good news. We go downstairs. We're going to have adult conversation, right? And then all of a sudden, you hear the little footsteps. How do they get out? I don't know. I mean, it's a pretty incredible thing that they do this. That is so much like our thoughts. You set them in the right place. You tell them to stay there. Don't come out. You come down. You're trying to have a, I don't know, good conversation with someone. All of a sudden, here are these thoughts again. What in the world is going on? God's saying, listen, man, this is something that is not done once. This is something that is done over and over and over again. The mind. This is where the most fiercest battles are fought and won. Satan, what does he do? He plants lies. He whispers insults. He seeds the mind with all kinds of thoughts that run counter to the truth of God. That's what he does. He knows if he can control your mind, he can control you. So this is why we rise above the attacks. And to rise above the the attacks, it requires a mind that minds Christ. That's what it requires. It requires a mind that is being renewed every single day. Paul says, and to have that kind of mind, it needs to be guarded by something. It it needs to be guarded and protected by something. And what protects it? What guards it? What word does God say to Paul and Paul begins to write down? What is it? We have a, a helmet of what? A helmet of salvation, right? So think of all the things that could have been. But we're instructed that we take on the helmet of salvation. So salvation, it guards our minds. Salvation, it protects our minds. How does it do that? This is what I've been thinking about all week. Of all the things God could have put in there, he put in salvation. Why did he put in salvation? How does this, like, practically and literally guard my mind in at least three ways? Let me touch on these pretty quick. Number one, salvation guards us by the past. Here's what I mean by that. We were saved by something that happened. Something happened by someone named Christ a long time ago on Calvary, on the cross. Salvation, it guards my mind by the past. I've been justified, right? This is the first part of the understanding of salvation, this massive comprehensive um, word that we have to understand. Salvific history points to a date when Christ conquered sin and death on a Roman cross. It points to a date when that Roman cross was occupied and three days later when the tomb was no longer occupied. This is really powerful stuff. Salvation, how does it guard us? It guards us by what has already happened. It guards us by what we just got done singing about, the love of God, right? This is how it guards us. The past, what has happened, becomes a helmet for our minds. Right? When we survey the wondrous cross, we see that Christ has already done it all. He's paid for it in full. Psalm 103, 12. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. The east will never touch the west. This is powerful. When we walk around with this kind of truth, our minds are guarded. Listen to this quote. I love this quote from St. Athen- Athenasus. I mean, just with that name, you know this is going to be a good quote. He became what we are, that he might make us what he is. I've been thinking on that for a number of days. He became who? Christ. What we are. What are we? We're sinners in need of a Savior. And you may not agree with that yet, but I'm hoping one day you will. 
He became what we are on the cross, taking upon himself the sins of mankind, getting ready to absorb the wrath of God. He became what we are. Who did? Christ. Well, why did he do that? So that he could make us what he is. What is he? He's righteous. Now, let me give you something to think about. In the eyes of God, salvation declares you as righteous as Jesus is. Well, that can't be the case. It is the case. Think on that for a little bit. And you keep walking around, and I keep walking around, reminding God of our sin. He's like, hold on a second. I don't see it. I mean, you can keep talking to me about it. I don't see it. You've been justified, man. You are covered. That exchange happened. Jesus said, you give me your garments of sin, I'll give you my clothing of righteousness. It's powerful stuff. That guards our mind. Guards our mind. Salvation guards us by the past. Not only that, it guards us in the present. Salvation guards us in the present. Salvation means we've been saved and we're being saved. Wait a second. John, are you saying that there's like, like I can point to a date, some of you can point to a date, some of you can't. You can point to more of a season maybe, right? Are you saying I need to like pray again and ask Jesus to, like I, I did that. What does this mean? Salvation, it is this massive word. This majorly comprehensive word. It means in part that you've been justified. This is what Romans 5 is all about. There's no longer this war with God. You now have peace with God. Salvation, it's what has happened. And at the same time, it's what is happening. It's what is happening. What is that? Big word. It's sanctification. What is that? It is your journey of becoming more and more and more and more like Jesus, and that protects us. Why? The only way that we work out our salvation is we walk in light. The only way that we can actually work out our salvation is when we fill our minds with truth. This protects us. This guards us. As we walk in truth, we're reminded of the truth. We think on such things. Salvation tells me I'm not a victim. No, I'm a victor. I'm not a mistake. No, I'm deeply loved by God. Salvation, it tells me I don't have to control everything. No, God's in control. He's sovereign. He's got it. Controlling the world is like, that's beyond your pay grade. You can handle a lot, right? You're high capacity. I get that. But you cannot control the world or the lives of other people. This is what salvation frees us from. Number three, salvation guards us from the future. There is a day when we're no longer going to have to fight this battle and take these thoughts captive. There is a day when we're going to be face to face with him. There is a day, man, where I'm going to say, I am finished. I can't wait. And that day, that's called glorification. That's when salvation has reached its full work, right? When we are face to face with him, this provides so much hope for me. This guards my mind as I look toward this day. Paul writes this in 1 Thessalonians 5.8. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. And this is a good reminder on Super Bowl Sunday. Let me read that again. Let us be sober. (laughs) Putting on faith and love as a breastplate in the hope of salvation. Wait a second. I thought they were already saved. What is he talking about? That great day. The hope of salvation as a helmet. I mean, I've given you guys so much to think about. I've just been just hammering you for like 30 straight minutes. I just wonder, what what is maybe the one thing God is wanting you to really, really hold on to right now? There is a battle, and oftentimes his greatest attacks is your mind. And oftentimes we can feel like we're a victim and there's no hope, but there is. We can actually take those thoughts captive. And God, through his truth, he can begin to actually rewire and rebuild our mind. Here's the last thing that's really important. As we've been instructed, take the helmet. This word take kind of threw me off, right? Because when I hear that, you know where I go in my mind? Well, I'm going to outrun all you people to get it. That's just the way I'm built, right? It's like steal the bacon. I'm going to push some people, right? I'm, I'm fast. I'm going to outrun everybody. Like, is this a striving thing? Because I know how to strive. Is this a running hard thing? I know how to run hard. Is this an outwork everything? I know how to work hard. It's actually not at all what it means. The Greek word underneath take actually means receive. Oh, this is so good. Think about it. We're getting to this part of the armor. This helmet that God is saying, no, actually, you receive this. 
If you want to understand salvation, it's just that. I mean, you can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't outrun everyone to get it. You can't strive for it. You can receive it. And so it's this image of a soldier out there in the battle. Man, he's taking a break and the helmet's off and the sword is down and the shield is down. Man, he's just catching his breath. And all of a sudden, like they're saying, man, the arrows are coming again. Right? We got to take our stand grab the shield, and in that moment, he turns, and there is someone extending to him what he better put on. And it's the helmet. And that day could be this day for some of you. Man, you have yet to turn and receive the helmet of salvation extended to you by Jesus himself. Him saying, here it is. I've already done the dimensions, custom fit. Would you put it on? Would you receive it? But Jesus, I haven't, no, just take it. But I haven't gone, no, just receive it. I'm extending it to you. I want to know, what are you waiting on? I'm serious, what are you waiting on? Others of us, man, we remember when we grabbed that helmet It's like we couldn't grab it quick enough. Are you kidding me? Like he's extending this to me? We took the helmet. We placed it on our head and yet we continue to do that. Why? Because we've been rescued for victory. Today we're going to take communion. And what that means is we're going to receive it. It's not a race up here. We're going to walk up here. We're going to pull up to the Lord's table. And we're going to take the bread that represents the body of Christ. And this is powerful for our mind. And we're going to dip that into the juice that represents the blood of Christ. And we're going to remember, we're going to think on the most incredible thing that ever has happened in human history. The Son of God came for our rescue. And so if you guys would stand to your feet, let me pray for our time of communion. When you guys are ready, you can approach the communion tables. There's two down here and two in the back. God, thank you. I'm asking God, we've been talking about this a lot, me and you. I'm asking you to help us right now. So many of us, there's just so much fog in our heads for a lot of reasons. I'm asking for like a clarity right now. I'm asking for you, Holy Spirit, to just come right now for you to help us think as you would want us to think. I'm praying right now that there'd be decisions made that would become these roadblocks. No longer, we're we're no longer just casually traveling those paths anymore. We're not doing it. God, give us your word. Make us diligent, vigilant about this. God, some, they came in this morning, they're entertaining lies. There are so many lies filling their minds. What I'm asking for right now, God, is that you would expose those lies. There'd be like a spotlight right now. Oh, they'd see it for what it actually is. I mean, that's not God. That's not who you are. No, that's, that's the lies of the enemy. God, would you do that? Just bring a spotlight. And God, we're going to take communion because you call us to do this as your sons and daughters to remember of all you've done and all you're doing and all you're going to do. We thank you so much. We thank you so much for the helmet of salvation. We ask this, Jesus, in your name. All God's people agreed and said, Amen.